know that our theme is sustainability uh, or sustainable, uh, sustainable environment. And this is not a new word for us. Um, I don't. I don't know if you recall. If you've been, if you're old enough to remember this, I, I am. Um, in 2008, Dallas went. Or we went green. We had a, a fall conference here in this hotel. I don't know if you remember that. That Dallas goes green. We were on the, the leading edge of engineering sustainability, and we had all these ideas. We had the exhibitors out in the hallway. And so we were starting to start thinking about green initiatives. I mean, I think at the time we thought it was a trend, but I don't think that is going to happen anymore. I think, it, I think it's here to stay. And it's not just for the tree huggers in all of us, you know. This is, this is something for our future. It's not for the next generation, it's for us today. So we're really fortunate to have someone who is a sustainable uh, leader. He, he's a consultant that um, is, is now, he's going to be the chair of the U.S. Green Building Council uh, for North Texas. And so, I mean, he knows a lot about what's going on um, in the vertical construction of, of, of this initiative of sustainability. We are obviously on the horizontal side, but at least we know that we have something coming just like LEAD is um, for us, so Envision, right? Um, so we're really happy to have um, Tom Powell here. He's with Good Fulton and Barrel Architects, and we, I mean, he's got um, a great uh, presentation on the Perot Museum and what he did as a sustainability consultant for them. He's also done several other art, art district's buildings that you might have heard of. Um, the Meyerson Symphony Center. Um, he's done things for the Crow Collection of Asian Art. Um, I mean, he's he's just been in Dallas for a while, and so if you have any questions about those buildings, uh, please ask him later. Um, but what what makes him so qualified to speak to us about sustainability is his background. He has a Bachelor of Architecture from California State Polytechnic University in Pomona. He also has a Master of Architecture from Syracuse University. And please be nice to him. They lost yesterday. Okay, so we'll be nice. Okay, so this, I mean, Mr. Powell's got a lot um, that he can share with us, and we're really fortunate to have him, so uh, I'm not going to keep going further. So if you'll welcome him with me. Thank you. Yeah, I had a, a Louisville and Syracuse in my top final four, so I'm kind of disappointed. How do, how do I get to my next one? How do, how do I see my next um, this is This is a slide that shows some of the work that I've done. Uh, I want to clarify that the Meyerson, we did the recital hall in the basement of the Meyerson, not the whole building, but it's a, it's a nice facility. Uh, the Crow Collection of Asian Art and some of the other projects downtown. We've collaborated with uh, Foster and Partners on Artist Square, and we're working with them on a box office uh, out in front of the Winsbury Opera House currently. Uh, I represent uh, the U.S. Green Building Council this year. I'm uh, the vice chair. I represent AIA Dallas. I'm on the board of directors there, and I'm on the Texas Society of Architects board of directors. So my, my experience has been very collaborative, and I'm very, very excited to see uh, ASCE get involved with sustainability and, and put, uh, put those efforts forward. Um, starting with the Perot Museum, one of the, one of the neat things about the Perot Museum is just the timing of it for me. I have a, a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, and so when they combined the museums in 2006, my daughter was two. And every time they went to the museum, they were down there at the, at the Museum of Nature and Science, and she has just absorbed uh, science. It's one of her favorite subjects. So to be asked to be, or to be accepted to be, the sustainability consultants for the Perot Museum of Nature and Science and their new facility was really a, a dream come true for me. One of the first things we started with for them was their sustainable design approach. Um, how, how are we going to go about making a museum of nature and science as sustainable as it can be? And so we, you know, we really set forth to have as wide of a view of sustainability as we could. Uh, we started this effort in 2009, and, and at that time, lead, the LEED rating system was probably the prominent uh, system that people had heard of, and there were about 25, 26 projects that had been certified in North Texas. 
But we wanted to think beyond that. We wanted to, to go a little bit wider than just uh, you know, what, was, what was known at the time. So we started with the American Institute of Architects Committee on the Environment. This group uh, was started in 1994 and given the task of how do we define sustainability in the built environment. So they put together first a, a list of 10 measures of sustainability. Uh, and I won't read through all of these, but they're up here on the list. So we, we adopted those measures of sustainability as core of our approach to sustainability. And then we looked at uh, different sustainable issues. The AIA uh, had put together this list of core issues for sustainability. Um, all of these are really larger issues than what you might address in one building, but there are things to think about in the design of a building. So we wanted to make sure that was a part of our uh, initiative. We wanted to look at uh, you know the sustainable issues that were really pertinent to uh, designing a building here in North Texas. The, the demise of the mass migrating pink flamingos, you know, maybe not so much, but there are a lot of the issues that really are pertinent to us, particularly water was uh, very high on our list. One, and so one of the things we wanted to make sure we did in all of our analysis and all of our evaluations of what, what initiatives and what things we could fit in the museum program came down to uh, performing a life cycle analysis of that and, wanted, and adopting that methodology. So when we were talking about the cost of a museum, for example, uh, the graph down at the, the lower left shows that only 11% of the money spent on the life of a building is its upfront construction cost. So we wanted to really look at this in terms of a long-term approach. And everything we looked at, we evaluated in terms of payback period and, and its life cycle analysis. The, the next thing we wanted to do is look at uh, building material certifications. There are numerous building material certifications, and we, we kind of set them in a hierarchy. There are those building material certifications that are the minimum that LEED recognizes. There are some that are considered above and beyond what's required for LEED. So we wanted to make sure we were pursuing everything above and beyond, but there are also some that maybe are below the requirement threshold. But we also wanted to consider those as well. So we really set this hierarchy so whenever there is a material decision to be made, we would have a, a, a source to go by to, to really make the best decision for materials. We looked at the Energy Star program really hard. We wanted to be a part of Energy Star. What we learned was that their, their benchmarking system doesn't actually have a category for museums. So we we're, gonna we're gonna have to wait, we're still waiting at this point for, for them to come up with uh, the CBEX for museums so that we can uh, benchmark it. <clears throat> we looked at uh, a few different rating systems and these, these became the three big ones that we, we considered at the forefront. Uh, we looked at ASHRAE 189 at the time. It was in its infancy and hadn't really gotten developed so we, were, we, looked, we focused on these three. The LEED uh, rating system, of course, which was tried and true. We all knew what to expect with that. We, we hadn't had any projects go through version nine, uh, three here in, in uh, North Texas. And so that was going to be new. So we, we took on the version three for, for LEED. Um, the Living Building Challenge. This is, this is the holy grail of sustainable construction. And, and at the time in 2008, there were zero projects in the world that had achieved living building challenge. But we, we held on to that as really this is still a goal. If we can hit parts of that, then it would be worth looking at. Uh, and then green gloves. Again, in 2008, there were no projects that had achieved green gloves certification here in North Texas. But we, we knew that green gloves would be a, a good product for uh, what we're doing with the museum. So we adopted a dual certification of strategy. And we, we pursued lead and green gloves for the building. As we were going through that process of finalizing our, our sustainability plan, uh, the Sustainable Sites Initiative started their pilot project. So um, we got the museum as a part of the pilot program on that. It's one of 13 projects in the state of Texas, and uh, it's, it's uh, still underway. We haven't finished all the Sustainable Sites work on that. So to summarize, what we, we set forth as kind of our broad strategy was to, to have our sustainable guidelines, to uh, address sustainable issues that were pertinent to the area, to use multiple green rating systems, and then to really apply a life cycle analysis to all of the, all the decisions we made. And then to really look at building materials from a, a hierarchy of, of both higher than what was required and lower than what was required. 
So at that point, we began the, the process. And one of the early things that we said was, <clears throat> since, since the museum is going to be so interactive for the kids, we really need to think of the building as an exhibit itself. And so uh, we, we put together this series of images that were uh, different places in the museum and what kinds of uh, interactive uh, exhibits they could be. Uh, we have solar hot water being uh, heated on the roof of the plinth roof. So when you go up the escalator, you can see where all of that is taking place. Uh, the solar light fixtures, uh, again, out in the garden. The smart grid building analysis exhibit, where you can really see what, what the building is doing in a lifetime uh, situation. And then we did a rainwater collection. So there's two cisterns on site, and in the north east corner, the water flows off the plinth roof and creates a waterfall into the cistern. So you really get to see how much water is coming off the plinth in any rainstorm, which was a little bit of a shock the first time we had it put together and it rained and there was a lot of water coming off of it. <laughs> Uh, then the rainwater collection measurement. In the courtyard, you have a series of pipes that help you also see the rainwater coming off the top part of the plinth roof. Uh, I haven't seen a lot of water come out of those, but I haven't been down there in a big storm yet either. <clears throat> Inside the building, uh, we've allowed the piping to be visible. So you, it's all color-coded, so you can kind of watch where it's coming from. The rainwater is being used both for landscape irrigation and for toilet flushing. So it goes into the building up to the, the roof where it all gets collected and then uh, sent down. So the, the pipes are visible, you can, you can watch them go, and it's, it's a good way for kids to learn about all those things. And in the main mechanical space, which is down the hall in the children's wing, there's little portals in the, in the wall so that the kids can look in and watch all the ducks, and all the ducks are color-coded, and they come into the big box, and it mixes the air and sends it back out. And it's, it's a fun way for kids to really get a sense of, you know, we, we live and breathe air, and we need it in our buildings, so this is where it comes from. And so all the, all the ceilings are semi-open, so you can trace the, the different colored pipes and ducts throughout the, the building. Even the elevator shafts, we, we left the glass walls in the elevator so you can actually see the other uh, elevators going up and down as you're riding in one. Uh, and, and for fun, at the top of the, the elevators, there's a steel beam in between the different elevators where everybody on the project got to sign. So, you know, as we go whipping by at 350 feet per second, we get to see if our name's there. The wall panels were a, a, fun, uh, a fun thing. The, the precast concrete wall panels, uh, Morphous has worked really hard to try to make them efficient for the precaster. And so what they did is they came up with a series of smaller forms within a form, and they would kind of shuffle around the forms inside to make different panels out of the same forms. And so it met both their desire for something unique at every panel, but yet the precaster got the efficiency he needed. So as we, as we completed our work and we, we got the, the lead work done, we did a, an energy model, and so I, I brought that and I broke it that down into a few different parts for us. One of the things that, uh, that we emphasized was the, doing the whole energy building model uh, per the, the lead requirements. And so Bureau Happel, who is a mechanical engineer on this, uh, did a really nice little report. They did the, uh, the original baseline model, they did the uh, four different steps to how we gained our, our energy savings. And so they've outlined in each step, you know, different things that we layered on and, and how much more difference that made. And one of the, the bigger steps was when we added the uh, light sensors and the daylight control sensors in the, the daylight areas and in the uh, offices, it really made a difference and it jumped the, jumped the energy model up significantly. And so we, we put all that together, they put that in the report, we had that in our, our lead summary. But then I, I, went, I went to the State Energy Conservation Office's website, because they have a little fun website where you can take your carbon footprint uh, effects and how that translates into trees, which is, you know, for a group that's teaching kids about sustainability, that's really something they can, they can get their minds around. And for us architects as well. So. Uh, if, if all of the electricity was provided by Western Coal, the Perot Museum would save 58,000 trees, which is an interesting thing. But you know, if it was oil, it would be 48,000 trees, 
And if it was gas, it would be 37,000 trees. And so that's an interesting difference between the, the, just the source for the electricity. I got a map that showed where, where our electricity comes from in the state of Texas. And what's interesting to me is how much gas we use and how much uh, wind we use. So really, our difference is very close to the, the minimum threshold of gas. So 38,000 trees in the state of Texas is basically what we've reduced the, the usage by in the, in the Peruvian. So then we were able to work with Green Globes. And, and Green Globes is probably not known by a lot of people, so I'll explain the system a little bit now. It, the, the way it works is you have a website, and as you're designing the building, there's a series of narrative questions that you respond to. A lot of times these trigger, hey, you know, we should ask the owner about this, and then that triggers the owner thinking, hey, you know, we should think about that. And then at the end, you, you, you get a report, and you say, this is where we're going with Green Globes. Uh, at, what, what's nice about Green Globes is you actually send your construction documents. You don't create a separate set of documents to a reviewer. He reviews everything. He actually comes out and physically inspects the building. And at the end, he sends you a nice little letter and says, hey, here's how you guys did. And uh, then he gives you a little percentage of here's your scores on each of the different categories. And for the Perot Museum, we got the highest rating of four globes. And that was really nice because he was able to do that at opening. So the, uh, the opening of the museum started with a, a four globes on the green globes. We're still in our lead process of running the building for 10 months before we finish our commissioning report. So this is a nice thing about green globes is we're able to give the owner something right at opening. Um, for the Sustainable Sites Initiative, they did a lot of site analysis. Uh, the, the site itself is on the edge of the Victory, Victory Park uh, uh, brownfield redevelopment. So that's an EPA case study and it's an exemplary uh, brownfield. But for, for the museum, it was, it was uh, mitigated to a commercial level, but they wanted to take it to a higher standard of a residential level. So that even at the beginning of the construction, we did more mitigation of the soil to make sure that it was safe for the kids. And so the, uh, the master plan of the museum shows uh, the different landscape strategies. One of the, the concepts of the landscape was to uh, have different zones around the site which uh, exemplify different uh, bioclimates in Texas. So you've got the, the high plains up on the plinth roof, you've got the east forest down in the, the entry courtyard. And then uh, just for, for reference sake, the figure ground study that they did shows uh, where the, the blue is up there of the museum. And the, the transportation, where, where they chose to site the museum is basically close to all of the dart lines that we've got in the Mata McKinney Avenue trolley as well. Uh, and this doesn't even uh, show the uh, Katy Trail bike trail that goes down there. So it's a really good pedestrian friendly, mass transit friendly site. And so uh, more of the, the landscaping sources, this diagram shows you kind of what he's, he's designed for each of the areas between the Blackland Prairies and the, the trees and the forest. There's a little section through all that. You can kind of see how it, you, you're able to see the site from the observation deck when you get up there, even though you're not, you're not able to walk out on the plinth roof, you can see all the, the, the environment from there. And then this diagram shows how the water was uh, collected around the site. We had the, the waterfall cistern up in the northeast. We have another cistern that's under the parking lot. And then there's little hints of where the water comes down that you get to see as you walk in. And this was the, the concept of firefly sight lighting. So it looks like a bunch of fireflies. These are conceived to be fire optic lights. Uh, this one wasn't realized, unfortunately. So uh, it's, it's one that didn't make the cut. And then uh, also around the building, they had this idea of shifting planes. And that got later reinterpreted to be the precast panels you see today. Of course, everything was done in a three-dimensional BIM model just to manage the complexity of the, the, uh, the project. Uh, not only in terms of the, the mass of things going on, but also the geometry. <clears throat> and then you can see in this uh, perspective the, the forest and the prairie on the front side of the, uh, the roof. And the front little courtyard, we, we recently had our USGBC event uh, right there in that courtyard. And it turned out to be a beautiful evening. We had a great time and it made it just a great outdoor room. And so this is the entry as you go into the museum. Uh, the cafe spills out into there and it really has become a nice space. 
Uh, they built a physical model. I don't know if any of you got to go visit this model when it was on display in the, uh, the center before they opened the building. But it slid apart. You could kind of look inside and see what was going on. And it was a very, very tall model, but uh, it also helped understand how the relationship between the planes of the ground related to the indoors. So you could see as, as the landscape went up and down and undulated, you would see it from different perspectives as you walk through the building. Okay, so uh, we've had a number of reviews now by, by different, uh, different people to kind of really test it. The frogs really like it, so they all, they all sing. <laughs> uh, we've got uh, an early article from Green Source DFW that uh, said that the Perot Museum is arguably the greenest building in Texas, and I, I always like when they say that because it leaves it open for argument. The uh, architectural record put it on the cover the first month that it was out, which was a big deal. We weren't surprised because there's Tom Main Morphosis, so they get a lot of press. But they also wrote a nice article about that, and it's been, it's been receiving good reviews uh, throughout. Dallas Morning News has written several articles about it, um, including uh, National Media Day. So in January, I was asked to come back and, and address them, and we, we looked at, back at the original uh, Committee on the Environment, top 10 measures, how did we really you know, match up? And, we, we went through this at that time, point by point, and it really, uh, it really made us happy that the, the, the realization of the museum has really seen a lot of the sustainability initiatives uh, developed and realized to a very high level. And we're very proud of that. Um, so to, to go on first, if, if I might, beyond just that museum, I pulled up the census, uh, the 2010 census data, and the dark blue here are states that are growing at 30% in that decade. So you can see that the whole Southwest is, is growing, and Texas is certainly a part of that. Uh, I saw the Forbes report that the fastest growing cities now are number one is Austin, number two is Dallas, and number three is Houston in the country. So we've really got uh, a lot of opportunity ahead of us. And so you know, what, what will the future of Texas be as this large growth of people come? Certainly the, the wind power is ahead of uh, every other state in the country. Transmission's been a challenge, but the wind power is, is getting generated. Uh, airplane travel, they're going to lift the right amendment. I hope this isn't what the first day looks like at Love Field when they do that. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> that's certainly going to be a challenge for us statewide in terms of transportation uh, to and from city to city. And I, I threw this, and this is Hoover Dam. This, I grew up in California, so this is kind of how I think of water. On the, on, the, on the north side of that dam is California's water. On the south side is Mexico's water. There's a bit of a disparity there. But California holds all of the, the water rights and transmits it across the state, as I'm sure all of you know. They also spend about 40% of their energy doing so. And so that's, that's a big, big challenge and a big cost for them. I've also found a, a desalination plant in Perth, Australia. And, and this fascinated me because when I was raised in California, we were always told, no, that's just not viable. That's just not realistic. We'll never be able to do that. But here they are in Australia, they're doing that. And it made me think, well, gosh, we've got an ocean in Texas. I wonder if we could do that here in Texas and you know, solve some of our future water needs that way. So anyways, uh, this is just kind of my vision of a future in Texas where we've got mass transit between cities and uh, desalination at the coast and wind power and generation in between them. And I, and I really hope that uh, that's part of our future together. Thank you for your attention. Well, thanks, Tom. And I mean, do you have any questions, um, people here? Audience, I'll take questions for a couple minutes here. Right. Mark, the kids like you. Kids love it. But I got to tell another story. So uh, as we were as we were working on this, the, the exhibit designers decided that they were going to do some discussions of people's early influences, right? And so somehow that got passed along to me. And so I'm, you know, I'm now an exhibit at the museum. And so my daughter, when she first went there, she said, Dad, I saw you at the, at the museum. It's great. So it's, it's fun to see the kids. They're just really enjoying it. Any more questions? Yeah, thanks for bringing that up. That's down on the first floor. And it's, it's a really good exhibit. Interviews everybody involved with the project. Okay. Sure. Okay. 
Um, if there's any other questions, um, Tom will stay a little bit after the meeting um, here uh, to answer that. Um, I just want to thank you, Tom. I mean, the Pro Museum is a, a joy for engineers, um, young and old, to um, to go see. So we're really glad to have you. And I mean, obviously, um, our future is in the hands of all of us and the um, architects that work together to have. Um, you know, think about the future, sustainable initiatives, and um, I think you bring up a good point about all the wind energy and all the different initiatives that we need to have um, to make sure that we have, a, you know, a future for our kids and our grandkids. So um, we have a little gift for you. Um, it's our ASC portfolio, and yeah, I know that you want to have something to remind you that you've been here. Yeah, that's nice. I can put this to use. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Um, we're so happy to have you. Thank you.